Guineans will on Saturday vote in the first parliamentary elections in the troubled West African nation in over a decade. The polls come after months of delays and a campaign plagued by deadly unrest. CCTV's Maria Galang has the story. Five million Guineans head to the polls. 1,700 candidates vie for 114 seats in a national assembly which will replace the transitional parliament that has been run in the country since the military rule came to an end in 2010. The vote was initially due to have been held within six months of the swearing-in of President Alpha Conde in December of that year, but it has been delayed amid disputes over its organization. This week, opposition protesters shot dead a trainee policeman as renewed clashes broke out across the city, leaving more than 70 people wounded. The election is really too hard because it seems like the government will do anything to win the elections, even by force. We are scared. We don't sleep. There is no security. Politics in Guinea typically polarizes some two dozen ethnic groups who otherwise live in harmony alongside each other, with the Fulani, the largest at around 40% of the population, followed by the Malinka and Susu. The country's iron-fisted first president, Ahmed Sekou Toure, was a Malinka who ruled for 26 years until his death in 1984 denouncing the economically dominant Fulani as hoarders of the country's wealth. When Alpha Conde, also a Malinke, defeated Fulani opponent Selu Dale in Diallo in 2010, this once again deprived the country's biggest and wealthiest ethnic group of political power again. A Guinean minister said on Wednesday that the country was, quote, in danger from outsiders plotting against it amid media reports that a coup was being planned in the capital, Conakry. Guinea is in danger and the strings are being pulled from outside. And some of the politicians that have sided off their political options are at the heart of this commotion. Despite having some of the world's largest bauxite reserves, as well as gold, iron ore and diamonds, most Guineans struggle to get by. Despite the tensions, many hope that this vote will usher in a new dawn for Guinea. Maria Galang, CCTV. Guinea is a country rich in natural resources, but more than half the population lives under the poverty line. Here are some other facts about the country. Bordering the northern Atlantic Ocean in tropical West Africa, Guinea covers 245,900 square kilometers. Its neighbors are Sierra Leone to the south and Guinea-Bissau to the north. And it shares borders with Liberia, Ivory Coast, Mali and Senegal. Guinea has a population of 11.2 million and the capital city is Conakry. French is the official language. 90% of the population is Muslim. The other 10% is Christian and animist, and its population is made up of some 30 ethnic groups. Tanzanian President Jakai Kakwete expressed solidarity with the Kenyan people on Friday in response to the attack on the Westgate Mall in Nairobi. At least 67 people were killed in the terror attack. Speaking at the UN General Assembly in New York, Kakwete said he talked with Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta to reaffirm Tanzania's solidarity in the fight against terrorism. Meanwhile, Mali's new president also took advantage of the platform to announce that his country will hold two rounds of legislative elections before the end of the year. Ibrahim Boubacar Keita told the UN General Assembly that the first round of elections will be held on November 24th, with the second round on December 15th. This heinous attack is a heartbreaking reminder of the threat that terrorism poses to humanity. Indeed, none of us is completely safe from terrorism as it can happen anywhere, anytime, and to anyone. We must therefore increase vigilance, enhance regional and global cooperation, and scale up the fight against terrorism. Ladies and gentlemen, Mali is back. Mali again takes up its place its rightful place in keeping with its rich history in the community of free and democratic states. The Malian people stand ready to take part, a fully-fledged part in building a world of peace, 
a world of tolerance, a world of freedom, and a world of justice in the world of democracies. À hauteur de son histoire, dans le Conseil de l'Action Libre et Démocratique. Meanwhile, the World Travel and Tourism Councils urge the Kenyan government and tour operators to reassure potential visitors about coming to the country in the wake of the deadly Nairobi mall attack. A cornerstone of Kenya's economy, the billion-dollar tourism industry accounts for 12.5% of the economy and provides one in 10 jobs. This concern the tourism industry could be affected by threats of terrorism. Kenya is East Africa's richest country, but more than half of its population still live on less than a dollar a day. It's been a week since Al-Qaeda-linked militants stormed the upmarket shopping center in the Kenyan capital, shooting at will and killing 67 shoppers, staff and security forces. However, some tourists who are visiting the country insist they won't change their plans. It hasn't deterred us. I was concerned about it, about coming. Uh, but uh, thought that uh, this is the right thing to do for the country, um, is, is to, to not hide. Um, I was a little skeptical coming into it all, but so far we haven't seen any effects of anything. Of course, we haven't been in the middle of a city where everything happened. Um, we're kind of staying away from that. Well, for more details on the Westgate Mall attack aftermath, we're joined live by CCTV's Jane Keogh. She's just outside Westgate. Jane, what's the latest with those ongoing investigations? Well, for me, the authorities uh, maintain that those investigations are in top gear. But what we do know at the moment is that several people have been interrogated, and they include a man said to have been the owner of one of the cars that was used by the terrorist, a Mitsubishi Salunka, which was found abandoned in the complex. Now, that man was interrogated. We are to verify whether that car was actually sold to the terrorist or hired to them for this particular purpose. Now, we also know that a Turkish national was also interrogated. Now, he was linked to, an, uh, uh, to a stall. He apparently linked to the terrorists and this is in light of growing indications strong indications that the terrorists may have rented the stall at the mall for 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 a while some are talking about for two months uh, but that is yet to be the ver verified the government officials have been mummed have been mum on this they they are treating the the information that these people actually rented a stall uh, in the mall as rumors uh, so, but that is one of the uh, big stories that's going on here uh, at the moment but i have to say forensic analysis continues we are also yet to find out how far they've gone with that. That's because we're yet to get uh, access into the building, which has now been cordoned off. Uh, Famida? Jane, as we've just heard from some tourists in Kenya, they will remain in the country. Despite that, the tourism industry is likely to uh, experience quite a severe blow. What is the government and tour operators doing to ensure tourists continue coming to Kenya? Well, for me, for starters, it's hard to quite uh, to tell uh, the, the exact impact in the tourism industry. But like you said, the government, especially the Interior Minister, has been making assurances and reassurances to the international community, to the tourists, that the country is safe. And I have to say, we've seen increased security, at least here in, the, in Nairobi, we've seen increased part street patrols. And the minister has also said that security has been beefed up along the country's border. Now, we've also had uh, the president make a statement to this particular effect. And I think for me that the fact that we've not had or seen any travel advisories issued against Kenya is a strong indication that the world and the international community stands united, stands in solidarity with Kenya at this particular uh, time. That never happened before. And uh, like we had uh, those tourists saying, that's the same thing we're getting here, particularly for those who are caught up in this particular incident. Uh, the fact that we saw them lining up with Kenyans to donate their blood is also an indication that maybe, maybe uh, it didn't uh, have uh, a big impact impact in the tourism uh, industry, at least that's what we are hoping. Famida? All right, Jane, thanks very much for that update. We're speaking there to CCTV Jane Keo just outside Westgate Mall in Nairobi. Now, in a related development, hotels and restaurants in Somalia have been warned they too are targets for Al-Shabaab terror attacks. The Somali government is urging owners to cooperate with security agencies. CCTV's Mohamed Emoge has more. Al-Shabaab has launched several high-profile guerrilla-style strikes in Mogadishu just two days after President Hassan Sheikh Mohamud took office. Suicide bombers attacked his hotel. The city's restaurants also have been hit. This is the village restaurant less than a kilometer from the presidential palace. It's a spot many would believe has tight security. 
But contrary to that, Al Shabaab attacked here twice in suicide blasts. The latest attack two weeks ago killed 18 people. Al Shabaab claims the restaurants are den for Western spies. The government fears more attacks are likely. Hotel and estate owners should closely work with security and intelligence agencies and should adhere to security conditions put in place by these agencies. Your cooperation is vital in maintaining security. Al Shabaab have on occasion infiltrated restaurants and hotels in Mogadishu and then attacked. The government wants owners and managers to be more vigilant. This is to ensure that criminals don't get operational bases where they can hatch plots to attack. Mogadishu has been rebuilding since African Union forces drove out Al Shabaab in August 2011. But Somali security forces remain on constant alert. Mohamed Irmogi, CCTV, Mogadishu. Africa Live now takes a quick break. When we come back, Strained ties? Why Egyptian foreign ministers uneasy about his country's relations with America? We follow the latest trends in global politics, economics, culture and sport and how Africa fits into the global picture. You decide what's important. We need a trade and justice. Africa's future will be determined by Africa. For women's equal opportunity for a better life. We have to change something and it's not the, the, the outsiders. Talk Africa, a new voice for the world. Welcome back now to Egypt and the country's foreign ministers described relations with America as unsettled. The two countries had been allies under Hosni Mubarak's rule, but recent political upheavals have strained relations. So what next? CCTV Yasser Hakim's filed this report. Relations between Washington and Cairo have rarely been stable, but in recent months they've been under pressure thanks to the election and then ousting of Islamist President Mohamed Morsi. The U.S. refrained from supporting the ouster of Morsi. It doesn't want a military-backed government and called for guarantees of a democratic transition of power and a halt to violence. This led to worsening relations. Egypt went as far as publicly denouncing the U.S. and politicians called for closeness with Russia as an alternative. U.S. President Barack Obama's speech this week at the U.N., however, has been described as a major shift towards reconciliation. He described Morsi as a leader who failed to meet the expectations of his people. Public opinion in Egypt is still skeptical. Egypt is an important power in the region, which the U.S. needs as an ally, to preserve peace for Israel while Egypt needs the U.S. support politically and economically. But what's next for the two countries? U.S. must take concrete steps to prove it's a real ally to the Egyptians to retain our trust. Egypt's foreign minister Nabil Fahmi opened the door, saying the country understands that U.S. policy after Morsi's ousting was a mistake. It is normal that many countries will reassess their position vis-a-vis -vis the current leadership because we know that the 30th of June revolution came as a surprise to all nations. And I'm sure that the U.S. and other countries will soon approach us, and we will welcome that. And there are signs Washington is reaching out. The U.S. announced on Thursday that it will strongly support Egypt in its quest for a badly needed loan package from the IMF and the World Bank. Another sign of good faith from the Americans. Yasser Hakim for CCTV, Cairo. Now for more discussion on this, Ran Farouk, a spokesperson for the Youth Revolutionary Council, joins us live from Cairo. Welcome to Africa Live. Now it appears as if both sides have uh, put in place attempts to mend the strained relationship. What is the feeling from the public in Egypt? Uh, I think the public opinion in Egypt now is um, <clears throat> really concerned, especially after uh, 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 the Obama statement in UN uh, Assembly. Uh, this major changes uh, uh, in US and Obama's policy uh, towards Egypt and uh, 
especially after uh, 13 of June revolution. Uh, but in, in public opinion, public opinion is still concerned about these changes. Because public opinion really, really convinced that uh, uh, the U.S. policy is uh, always, always beside the Muslim Brotherhood and supported supported the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, we we say, uh, and as we say, in, in, uh, after the 13th of, uh, of June uh, revolution, uh, that the situation in U.S. policy uh, towards Egypt was. Supporting legitimists and ousted, uh, ousted the Morsi, Dr. Morsi, ousted president. Uh, so now we concern about this change, but but in in the grassroots, uh, people doesn't change that much. Yeah, people does does really expect more from uh, Obama's policy and from U.S. policy towards Egypt and also Middle East, not just Egypt, uh, also the Palestinian case and also uh, in Tunisia, all, all Africa and, and Middle East. So now we just keep watching and keep forward and make uh, a new relationship uh, with the interim government here in Egypt and U.S. Uh, policy, foreign policy. All right, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you very much for speaking there to Ran Farouk, the spokesperson for the Youth Revolutionary Council in Egypt. Now, in other news, making headlines, Nigerian Islamist group Ansar on Friday released a video of a French national kidnapped in December. In the video posted online, a 63-year-old of Francis Colomb, who was kidnapped in northern Nigeria on December 19th, reads a statement with an unidentified person holding a weapon in the background. He was working as an engineer for a French company when he was abducted. Parts of his short statement are not clear, but he can be heard calling for his safe release and negotiations with the French and Nigerian governments. Ansara, considered a faction of Nigeria's Boko Haram, is deemed to have links with the Maghreb branch of Al-Qaeda. Elsewhere, thousands of Sudanese protesters marched through the Sudanese capital Khartoum on Friday demonstrating against recent price hikes in fuel and gas. Protesters poured out of mosques and marched in several parts of Khartoum, as well as other cities, including Wad Madani, where the unrest began five days ago. The Sudanese government announced cuts to fuel and gas subsidies on Sunday, causing prices to leap and sparking public outcry. And in Morocco, the economy has been severely affected after Algeria moved in June to cut its fuel line to the country. Before the move, petrol smuggling literally drove Morocco's neglected eastern region, where the subsidized liquids smuggled in from Algeria fueled the local economy. Algiers took drastic measures to curtail the illegal trade, clamping down on traffic across its border with Morocco, which has officially been closed since 1994. Finally, residents of several suburbs in the Senegalese capital, Dakar, have been experiencing a water shortage for almost two weeks. Most of the affected areas are Grand Yoff, Grand Medlin, Perse Asani and Rufisk. Many have to wait in the scorching sun all day in the hope that the tankers mobilized by the Senegal Water Company will deliver water. Residents who can't afford bottled water are forced to draw water from dugout wells which pose potential health risks. It's time now for another break when we come back. Heroes from Westgate, we speak to a man who risked his life to rescue scores during the Westgate Mall siege. First round of beatings, Wangari got very severely injured. It's like they had targeted her. So she got hit on the head, she got hit on her back everywhere. You look at her at home and wonder, is this the same person? Because she's so gentle and calm like a dove at home. And then she gets out there and the passion for whatever issue of, it is of the day that she's concerned about, you know, she really fights hard. Wangari had the best smile. And she maintained it to the last minute.
You're watching Africa Live. Now, hundreds of stories have emerged from Westgate this past week of the terror attack, the fight for survival and of sheer courage. But one man's bravery has captured the hearts of many Kenyans. CCTV's Celestine Karone has more. The first few seconds of the horror at Westgate. Within moments, hundreds were fleeing from the mall. Abdul Haji was trying to get in. As soon as I got to the wastegate, and immediately I started thinking, you know, uh, they're probably here after my brother. What had happened was there was a local expose from one of the media houses, uh, which had exposed my brother, who's, uh, who works for the government. He's an undercover agent in the counter-terrorism counter unit. And uh, since then, we've just been living in fear. This is basically what I'm thinking. Uh, so suddenly the uh, Red Cross people arrived. We just very quickly organized ourselves. Uh, our priority was, uh, since we were armed, we're going to give cover to the Red Cross people to get the injured people out. So we went up through the ramp uh, to the upper level parking. And uh, I, think, I think when I reached there, when, what I saw at the, at the upper level, uh, basically, um, uh, this is the point where I realized the magnitude of the whole thing. Because the number of people that I saw massacred over there. At this point, I, I, it dawned on me that this is much more than people after my brother. So as a team, we, we moved in. Uh, we, we, we kept uh, securing every place we passed. Um, uh, there were people still uh, hiding in shops. They had locked themselves inside. Uh, by the time we reached the ground level, we were about five of us. I think there were three plainclothes police officers. These guys opened fire. Uh, and at this point, they shot one of our colleagues. You know? We immediately um, exchanged fire with them. Uh, and then suddenly somebody started shouting, hold fire, hold fire. We, 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 held, uh, we stopped shooting uh, and tried to evacuate the guy who was injured. So we were trying to get closer to the Nakumat entrance where the terrorists were. Uh, that's where we, uh, as, as we were doing that, we realized there was a lady hiding under a table who was right in the middle of the crossfire. Uh, and, and we thought uh, our priority at this time was to get them out, get them to safety before we, we engage the terrorists anymore. Uh, and at this point, we told the lady if she can run towards us. And then she told us, I can't, I have three kids with me. So very quickly we told her, can you send the eldest out? We will get her. And then you come with the rest. And, and I think it, it just took a second, she convinced the little girl, and she, she started running towards us. And I thought she was really, really brave. You know, she, she was a very, very brave little girl. So we got her out of the way and then her, uh, the, the lady came with another baby and another uh, lady, I think the mother of the girl, came with another baby. So we got them out. I went to the toilet where I thought my brother was, was hiding. Uh, I called for his name. Uh, I didn't get him. Uh, so I reached to my, my, my phone uh, so that I can call and find out what happened to him. And I saw a message from him saying he's out, he's safe. And he was telling me, come out, please come out. The 38-year-old was taught to handle guns at an early age by his father, a former minister of defense. Um, the only thing that was going through my mind throughout the ordeal was to stay alive, uh, to give cover to my team. As, as, as a country, uh, Kenya needs to go after the terrorist um, and to take the, the war to the, to the doorsteps of the terrorist. We know where they are. We know where they're planning these things. Uh, so basically what we need to do is to keep them on the run so that they don't have time to plan such an attack again, ever. Celestine Karone, CCTV, Nairobi. Certainly a true Kenyan hero. Now, moving on, many of the world's deadliest infections first emerged among animals and many of them in Africa's Congo Basin. Now, health officials from the region are to collaborate to try and stop these natural-born killers. CCTV's Maria Galang has the story. Experts from health, education and agriculture from Ethiopia, Vidyar, Congo, Rwanda, Uganda, Kenya and Tanzania drawn together in Addis Ababa as the One Health Central and Eastern African Network. They have one mission in mind, to detect new infections among animals and to stop them spreading to humans. 60% of the diseases that man suffers from, from come from animals. So there is a need for us to work together. We cannot afford to continue spending more, 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 more money and resources and also people suffering because of lack of coordination. 
In the past 60 years, more than 300 new diseases have been reported, almost two-thirds of them from animals. They include Ebola, HIV and the H1N1 flu virus. There are three primary areas where new diseases emerge from. Uh, one is in Southeast Asia, uh, one is the Amazon region of um, the Americas, and the other is the uh, Congo Basin, Central Africa, uh, within the Africa region. The One Health Network wants to harmonize health services that deal with humans and animals and create a task force that can detect potential threats and contain any outbreak. Much of the work will depend on changing attitudes. In our culture, we have a, a tradition to drink uh, raw milk. We have a tradition to eat raw, uh, raw meat. So those could be potential sources, you know, unless we uh, assure that the, the animals are healthy. Every year, disease kill millions in Africa. Officials say cross-border and cross-discipline collaboration is critical to saving lives. Maria Galang, CCTV. Well, that's it for this edition of Africa Live. Remember, you can stay in touch with us on Twitter using the handle at CCTV News Africa. You can also visit our Facebook page, and that's also CCTV Africa. I'm Famida Menem. Thanks for watching.